SpaceX Starship, the beginnings of space-based electricity. Is that even a thing? Let's get into it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again joining me for Tea Time. Today, we're coming to the end of some misty morning and focus. Gotta love it. That bergamot, that zing. I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, hanging out, talking tech, talking a lot of space, SpaceX, Starlink, and of course, Linux. Today is going to be a SpaceX day and a little bit of Starship, a little bit of solar, a whole bunch of good stuff. I was reading some articles just yesterday and I said, you know, I have to talk to you guys about this because it's amazing. And I just, I don't even know how it's even possible, but it is. And it's basically getting electricity from space. So just imagine having solar panels, a whole big massive solar array here on Earth. And of course, those arrays are not going to see sunlight at all during the nighttime. So 50% of the time, as well as sun up and sun down, you're not going to have quality, strong sun. So what's the alternative? How about if you were to put one of those massive solar arrays on orbit in space? That would be good, right? Because if you get the right orbital pattern, you don't have to worry about ever leaving sunlight. You'll have sun all the time on those solar arrays. Now, what do you do with it? Well, you beam it down. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about today, which I think is absolutely fascinating to be able to do this. And it's not science fiction, it's science fact, which is really, really cool. So before we get into this article, I just wanna say that if you enjoy the content, you find it interesting or maybe entertaining, throw it a thumbs up, that's very helpful. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not. If you are, thank you, I appreciate that. Click the notification button here and then click all. So when I go live or when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. That's what YouTube says, at least. Also, if you wanna say thank you for all of my hard work on this channel, there's a little thank you button down here. Click on that, give a dollar or two if you want. If not, that's perfectly fine. The video is still free. Consider becoming a member of the channel. That would be even better. And if you haven't downloaded any of my eBooks yet, they're free just for you being here. Go to jchristina.com forward slash books. Once again, jchristina.com forward slash books. And if you want more Starlink specific, content. I've put together over 480 videos for you. I'll put a link right here. Don't click on it yet. A playlist link will be there. When you're done watching this video, go click over there and you'll see a lot of helpful how to's, tips, tricks, what to do, what not to do, what to buy, what not to buy. And of course, the why behind all of it, because this channel is about what? Not the what, the why, <laughs> not just the how, the why. So anyways, let's jump right into this article. It starts out by saying Starship and the solar power revolution in space, a bright idea above the clouds. What if the sun could power your home 24 seven? No clouds, no sunset, no interruptions. That's exactly what a new wave of startups is working towards, putting giant solar panels in space and beaming the electricity down to Earth. While it sounds like science fiction, the concept is grounded in real physics. And now, thanks to SpaceX's massive starship, it might finally be affordable enough to pull off. Could you imagine? SpaceX Starship, the heavy lifter Earth needs. Until now, one of the biggest hurdles to building solar power stations in space was getting them up there. These structures will be huge, some the size of multiple football fields, and assembling them in orbit is no small task. That's where Starship comes in. SpaceX's fully reusable Starship promises to slash the cost of space launches by carrying over 100 metric tons per trip. That is a lot of cargo. That's a game changer, it is. Instead of needing dozens of small rockets, companies can load their entire platform or large chunks of it into a single Starship flight. For the space solar dream, this isn't just helpful, it's essential. Meet the players, Virtus Solis and Space Solar. Leading the charge is Virtus Solis, a Michigan startup founded by John Bucknell, a former SpaceX engineer. 
That kind of makes sense. The company's vision is bold. Launch massive solar arrays into high elliptical orbits that keep them in sunlight longer than typical satellites. These extended sun windows allow arrays to collect uninterrupted solar energy, which would then be beamed back to Earth using microwave transmissions. I know what you're thinking. Hold on. Virtus Solis plans to launch a test satellite by 2027, with hopes of rolling out a full-scale commercial system by 2030. Across the Atlantic, British company Space Solar is working on a similar concept. Their project, dubbed Cassiopeia, aims to beam 30 megawatts of clean energy from space to ground-based receivers. Like Virtus Solis, their entire strategy relies on launch systems like Starship, making space more accessible than ever. The challenges and why they might be solved. Beaming power through the air sounds wild, but there is still plenty of engineering and regulatory challenges ahead. But falling launch costs and better robotics for in-orbit assembly are closing the gap between science fiction and reality. Starship, powering the future, literally. If these solar power stations succeed, they won't just be powered by the sun, they'd be powered by the starship. Without SpaceX's enormous rocket, the economics of lifting such massive equipment simply don't work. But with it, space-based solar power could light up the planet in a whole new way. Absolutely the case. This is absolutely fascinating to me. I love this stuff because I really like solar. I think that solar is just amazing. I just know that solar is a problem as of right now because there's only so much solar that you can gather at a specific period of time because there is a small window for the maximum amount of solar energy. That's number one. And then also the solar panels are not as efficient as they need to be. And I remember listening to one of Elon Musk's interviews not that long ago and he was talking about solar panels and the solar cells and how they're literally really close to being maxed out when it comes to efficiency. So the only thing you could do is make the solar arrays larger in comparison to making a better solar panel. They have a little bit of room, but mathematically, there's only so much that they can do. So by doing this and putting those solar arrays the size of multiple football fields on orbit, instead of here on Earth, that would be a major, a just, it would be huge. Just think about the amount of solar energy that it can capture, capturing 24-7, 365 days a year. You don't have to worry about a rainstorm, a hailstorm, a dust storm, any type of inclement weather. You don't have to worry about night. <laughs> it's literally solar all day, 24-7. Once again, if it's in the right orbital track, which is really interesting here. So the question is like, how does this all work? How are you going to get this to us? And the bottom line is it's going to be sent through microwaves. And I'll get into that in just a second. I want to bring up a couple of things that I was researching about this. That I found fascinating. And the idea of being able to beam electricity from orbit all the way down, let's say, 500 kilometers to Earth, to me, is just amazing. But, I mean, we do have things like inductive, for example, electricity, where there's no wires. You just take, for example, your phone, you stick it up against this plate, and it starts charging, right? And if you pull it away a little bit, guess what? It's still charging. Maybe a little bit less, but it's still charging. So it is charging through the air, let's call it, inductive. So it's the same type of thing, but this would be done through microwaves. And... If you think about it this way, if there's a way to do it and have no poles and no wires and no fuel and no sun blocking clouds and no nothing, the amount of efficiency would just be absurd. Absolutely absurd. Just think about this, having on the top of your roof, instead of having a SpaceX Starlink dish, an antenna, you have another form of antenna that's pulling in electricity. <laughs> Could you imagine that? I mean... It's possible. It's definitely possible. I think at first they'll probably do it where there'll be sites that actually receive the signal, let's call it, or the microwaves, and then almost like a power plant. But there's nothing there that's powering it besides the air, microwaves coming down from space. I think that would be absolutely amazing because it's almost like a substation and then it'll feed out a small community. And you'd have a bunch of these substations. So 
If you do get that right orbital plane, and now you don't have to worry about seasonal drop-offs or any type of nighttime or clouds or whatever, you know, you're talking about a massive change when it comes to the idea of electricity. Electricity wouldn't be free. I think eventually electricity will be free, but for now, it will still be paid for, but you would be able to get it remotely. You would be able to use a small collector dish, let's just call it for now, in a disaster recovery zone where there is no power. You could use it on the top of a mountain or maybe you're a hiker. And not only do you want to communicate through SpaceX Starlink's dish, but maybe you have a small dish that's pulling in power. Maybe it's a small amount of power, but maybe enough to charge up your Jackery, <laughs> your EcoFlow or whatever you use. So instead of having these massive solar panels with you, 200, 300, 400 watt solar panels and having to hike that around with you, maybe you just have this small collector and now it's collecting all day not just during the day, but also through the night 24 seven. I mean, that would be really amazing if you think about it. Now, when I was reading about like the size of these things, they were saying they're gonna be multiple football fields. They said, take a look at a skyscraper, take that skyscraper and lay it on its side. And that's basically the size of these things, which is absolutely massive, obviously. And that's why you would need something like Starship to be able to bring up, what is it, a hundred tons of cargo each and every launch. My understanding also is that Starship will be able to launch cargo at around $10 per kilo. I mean, that's cheap. I mean, there's no other company that's going to be able to do that, period, $10 per kilo. So now all of a sudden, once again, it becomes feasible. The other thing is, is you can't have astronauts on orbit building these things, all right? You just can't do it. There's, it's just too massive of a structure. They would have to be set up in modules and unpack themselves and roll out or self-construct. It has to have zero human intervention. So maybe you also have robotics, robots that are in these modules that help assemble as they roll out. You know, when a SpaceX Starlink satellite in orbit, people don't realize this, but the wingspan of these things are massive. You know, it's not like 15 feet. You know, it's like 60, 80, 100 feet. They're massive, but they start out the size of about six inches. That's about it. And then Starship is going to launch these little six inch little chunks out into space. And then they're gonna unfold themselves into these massive, massive, in air quotes, satellites. But that's just simply unrolling because they're not that big. This kind of thing needs to be modular. They're the only way to do it because these things are going to be huge. But there's a couple other use cases that they didn't talk about in here that I think that would be really, really interesting. Think about this, maybe not only, like I said before, if you're RVing, you can get power, or if you're on the top of a mountain, you can get power, or you're in a disaster zone, you can get power because there's no electricity, you can still get power. That's all great, okay, that's fantastic. But imagine now being able to power the moon. You can do that, send the microwaves to the moon, you can do that. You can also put some of these orbiting around the moon, all right, and get the power there and beaming it down once you get it working, let's say, well here. Another thing would be interesting is something that I talked about two years ago. I said, one day we're going to see a time when there's going to be satellites on orbit that will be NOx, network operation centers, COs, central offices, but in space. Why do I say that? Well, I predicted that there was going to be a internet too a second version of the internet. I'm not talking about the dark web here, but a second internet that will be on orbit. And will only data come down to you after you make requests and the requests will happen up there in space and everything will be bounced back and forth from satellite to satellite at the speed of light in a vacuum, even faster than the speed of light here on earth in fiber optic cables. So speed of light through lasers in a vacuum, but then, the data, once again, will never come down until it's requested, let's say. So you can have large network operation centers like you would have here with a massive central office somewhere on the backbone of the internet. But now just think about a backbone up in space. My thought was the only way to be able to do that, you couldn't do it through solar at the time. You couldn't do it through solar because it would just be massive, right? You would have to use nuclear of some type 
right? So it'd have to be powered through a nuclear device of some sort. But seeing that this is a possibility and having these massive solar arrays that are literally the size of a couple of football fields, at this point I can say, well, they'd be able to beam the microwaves directly to that CO, that central office, let's say, or the NOC, and do so right on orbit very closely and have basically full power that's coming off these things where you don't even have to have on that central office, on that network operations center, you don't even have to have a solar array. That's all you have to have is a big collector and that's it. Let the solar array do its thing and then send you through microwaves the power. That would be interesting. Anyways, I'm just speculating here. I know a lot of you guys, and I told you I was gonna get back to it, are gonna be like, you know, if they start sending down microwaves that are energetic microwaves that are going to then turn into energy that we're collecting here on Earth, aren't we going to get fried? And the answer to that is no they will not fry you. You can actually stand in the cone of one of these and you're not gonna get fried. And the reason being, it has to do with frequency. Basically, you're gonna have the exact same amount of radiation as if you stood in the sun, and that is it. So you're not gonna to have to worry about that. They're gonna dial it in. Also, there's gonna be safeguards and probably some type of international regulation so that no one can turn these things up and actually start frying people. Could you imagine that? That would be a bad thing, right? Almost like a kid playing with a magnifying glass, frying ants. Don't get into all that, all right? Let's 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 not think that way. Let's just think this is going to be a positive thing. Um, once again, it's not going to be free energy, but it's gonna be damn clean energy for sure. And even if you were not, okay, to be able to walk into these cones of microwaves, let's just say, but you can, but let's just say they want to turn it up so it's really powerful. They can actually take maybe a mile or a half a mile or a certain sector, instead of putting solar arrays, let's say, just put collectors and have those things beam down that energy into those collectors and they have a substation and then send off that energy through the copper like we currently have. That's a possibility too. But either way, I think this is fascinating. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you would think about or I would think about back in the Star Wars and Star Trek days when I was a kid. You would think about things like this, like is this possible, is it not possible? I mean, the things that we can do with our phone today, I mean, <laughs> This is the kind of stuff that you would see back in Star Trek, where you'd see video, be able to talk to people. This is just absolute absurdity just 50 years ago, 60 years ago. It's not even, it's, no one would even dream such a thing. And to be able to get power, literally through the air, through an inductive means, is just, <laughs> that's crazy too, right? Anyways, guys, what say you? I love this stuff. Do you? Down below, I want to hear your thoughts. What do you think about all this? And if you enjoy this or maybe find it amusing or maybe entertaining, throw the video a thumbs up. That'll be very helpful. Do you think that free energy is a possibility? What do you think about all of this microwave stuff? Are you kind of scared about it? Or do you realize that it could be safe? What do you think? Down below, put an emoji down there. If you're shy, you don't want to put anything down there. That's fine. An emoji is good. At least I know you got to the end of the video. I'd appreciate that. Also, head over to my website, jchristina.com forward slash shop. Once again, jchristina.com forward slash shop. Check out my merch, my tees, my books, my shirts, all my stuff over there. If there's something there you like, please pick it up. Help support me and my family. Many blessings to you and your family. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay connected, and we'll see you in the next one. Love you guys.